So um, the talk title is um, Lessons Learned from Evaluating the Robustness of Defenses to Adversarial Examples. Um, this is a little bit long, and I'm going to go through my talk sort of backwards. And I'm going to start talking about adversarial examples, then talk about defenses, then talk about evaluating the robustness of these defenses, and then the lessons we learned from that. Um, now, OK, um, we've done this enough, um, so I figured I'd show you a new picture. Um, this one you haven't seen before. It's another picture. Um, this is true. OK, we can all move on. Good. Um, OK, uh, so how do we generate adversarial examples? Um, we've seen a little bit of this um, from the math perspective. What I want to do is show you a little bit of pictures that I find helpful in, in just sort of understanding what's going on in this space. Um, OK, so what I'm showing you here is the actual decision boundary analysis of a CIFAR neural network. Um, so I have in the middle here some image of a dog. Um, each pixel here corresponds to the classification where I'm color coding the classification to each of the 10 different classes. Um, as I go in one axis, I add one type of noise. And as I go on the other axis, I add an orthogonal type of noise in pixel space. Um, so you'll see, for example, this is an image that is also um, a modified version of that dog, but I've added a huge amount of noise to it, and it's now classified incorrectly as a truck because it's in this dark blue region. Before I go anywhere, is it clear what this picture is showing? So if I move in two random directions, and as I move away, I, I'm no longer in this light blue region, and I'm no longer being classified as dark. Are these random directions or most sensitive directions? Yeah, these are, these are two random directions. I picked one, or I picked one, and I picked the other one to be orthogonal to the first. Now, in high dimensions, everything I thought was orthogonal every, anyway, um, but I, I did it just to be, be sure. Okay. Um, so now what I'm, oh yeah. Is this space the uh, uh, feature space of the? No, this is pixel space, just pixel. direct pixel space. Um, I just sort of added a random amount of noise and went in that direction. Okay. There are three colors. Uh, OK, so there are actually more than three colors, but you can't really see clearly on this. Um, so this, light, th this region here is um, dog. The one around it is airplane. And then the dark blue is truck. Um, now, I guess some of you on maybe the other monitor can see that there's actually a different color region here and there. Uh, you just can't see it on this one. But uh, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, the basic idea I just wanted to show you is I'm adding a huge amount of noise to get this, um, this incorrect label. And it's enough noise that I don't care. Like, I can't actually tell what that image is without knowing that that was the original image. So even though I've added a large amount of noise, I'm OK with that. This is not an adversarial example to me. Um, OK. So the basic idea of what we like to say in adversarial examples is I'm going to pick some small boundary that is contained within the area and say, can the adversary find something within this small box which is misclassified? And in two dimensions, the answer here is no. And I can just enumerate all of them. Um, but of course, this picture is a lie. You know, we're actually in a 3,000 dimensional space, and so I can pick a different axis, um, and the image will look like this. So I'm continuing this y-axis to be the same, but now the x-axis is different. It's now the worst case direction. And now if I draw, um, if I like, can like, find this point here is now an airplane. I've sort of extended the green region here, and if I put the box around it, like it's within the box. So this is the problem, basically, of episode examples, is that in random directions, you, you're, you're safe. Everything is fine. But if I pick the worst case direction, then it's very easy to find an episode example. It's sort of like most of the space. OK. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one more thing to this picture. And I'm going to extend it to be three-dimensional. And when I'm going to do this, I'm going to make the z-axis be the confidence of the neural network in the correct prediction. OK. I'll say it one more time, uh, just so it's clear. So I'm going to make the same image, but I'm going to make it be three-dimensional. And the third axis is going to be the confidence of the neural network in the correct prediction. Yes. You're just using the gaps in the upper to the south max and calling that confidence, right? Yes, right. No, it's not actually like there's not actually, it's, it's not, a, of course, models aren't calibrated well. But as far as it reports to me, I'm going to use, the, use this as a proxy for confidence. So it's. If, what happens if, if for, so can this be negative, or what do you mean confidence in the correct direction? OK, in the correct prediction. So this, this point here at the very top is, when, is, is the image which it believes is definitely the label dog. Okay. And the important thing to note is that in this adversarial example, uh, in this adversarial direction, sort of going one way doesn't really change the prediction very much. But going the other way, very, very, very quickly, if you do gradient descent, 
will let you find an adversarial example and switch the classification and bring the confidence down basically to zero. So like this image, this point here corresponds to an image which is not changed basically at all, but the confidence that it's dog is now zero. Wait a minute, uh, what's confidence? A softmax prediction in the label dog, basically. Oh, softmax prediction in the label. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, OK, this, this picture is, um, an, uh, again, I'm lying to you, but uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So the high confidence points is close to the boundary? Um, so this is the initial image right here. Yeah. And then it, because, I mean, because Lipschitz constant is uh, enormous, it can very, very quickly decrease. And it is close to the boundary, yes. So the point is that it, I, mean, I would expect to the, to the peak to be at the center of the classi classifier. But one of the dimension is the worst. Yeah, so, so this direction is the worst case direction. It's the adversarial direction. So if I, if I go back to here, right? In this way, I can go up or down quite far before the label changes. This is, this is a random direction. There exists a direction in which you're going to be close to the boundary. Yes. Which in high dimensions, like, and the interesting fact is this is basically flat. But, but it's still in that direction. I would expect the peak to be on the left, left, further left. What do you, you mean the peak? Uh, uh, yeah, on, on that direction. The peak of the classifier. Uh, right, OK, yeah, maybe it if would it be. Right thing, if it's doing the right thing. Yeah, if it was doing the, it be, yeah, the right thing. If it was doing the right thing, maybe, but it's not, okay. is the argument we're making. Um, and yeah, so, so the peak. This is an actual picture from, this is an actual picture from a trained ResNet of what it actually does. Like, I'm not sort of lying in respect to that. Um, uh, yes? Can you tell us what is the slope of the green in the blue area? What is this? The, you can do this. How steep is that cliff? How steep, how steep is this cliff here? Of, no, of the truck. If you look at the, if you look at the confidence of predicting truck, how would that look like? I think that's the Ah, point. I see. OK. So the height here corresponds to confidence in dog. So and can you tell us about the slope of the truck? Right. Um, yes. OK. So, so I can. Um, so, what it would, so, so there would be an inverse image here. So if you were to look, if I were sh instead were to show you what the, um, so OK. So, so this one here, this green is classified as airplane. If I were to show you the other image, which was confidence in airplane, you'd have another big giant spike right here. So the image that I'm going towards is optimizing towards airplane. Does that answer your question? Kind of. OK. OK, so the argument I just want to make is that first, gradient descent is very easy to, to solve. I mean, like, this is a very nice surface. It's very easy to optimize over. I just sort of compute gradient descent, and I very quickly find an adversarial example, which is very high quality. That's the first thing I want to make clear. The other thing I want to make clear is that um, it's not like there's, like, just isolated pockets of adversarialness that are sort of isolated, at least when you look at this in low dimension. Um, that there are these large surfaces where you can go, um, and once I've gone here, I can travel in this orthogonal direction, and it remains the adversarial class. Yeah, well, to be clear, they're not large surfaces. They have exponentially small volume. Um, OK. Yes, so this one has, so this plot is only in two dimensions. Um, there are papers that, that estimate the dimensionality of the adversarial subspace and find it's around like 30 dimensional or something. Right, which so is, uh, right, which is still very oh, exponential in what is hard, a little hard to define. It's 30 dimensional in a 3,000 dimensional space. So it's a small fraction of that, but it's not like an isolated pocket. Like they're connected regions that. So let me say it another way. So it is fully consistent with the fact that random sampling methods do not find adversarial examples. Uh, say that again? The Lebesgue volume is, is, is sort of vanishingly small. OK. And so that's why if we do random sampling, we're not finding adversarial examples. Sure. Uh, yes, I will agree with this statement. <coughs> OK. Um, so all of this is just to show sort of some visual intuition of what's going on here. Like gradient descent is great at finding these things, uh, and it's sort of nice to understand this. Okay. So um, now let me sort of talk about something different, which is threat models, um, just very briefly. So when we typically state adversarial examples, we are like drawing this box and say you must be within this box. And the reason we do that is because we want to make sure that you don't perturb the image by too much. 
you change the image by a lot, obviously you can change its classification for non-constant functions. Um, so a threat model is sort of a formal statement that defines when a system is intended to be secure. Typically we'll say that, you know, I might say, um, okay, like my system is, is robust when the L2 distortion is less than five. And then I have this other caveat that like given the attacker has white box knowledge. And what this means is for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to assume that the person who's trying to generate these episodic examples knows everything there is to know about the defended model. This is the assumption I've made, which was also made by the prior talks, but I just want to make this explicit. There are other assumptions you can make, like maybe the attacker doesn't have access to the model weights. Um, that could be realistic. Um, you know, when I was at university, I didn't have access to the classifier that Google was using. And so I might know the type of thing they were using. I might know that they're probably using some inception network, but I might not know exactly the values of the trained weights. I'm going to assume that I know everything about it. I know all of the weights and everything. Uh, and once you have a threat model, then you can make some kind of claim and say that I'm claiming that under this threat model, I have 90% accuracy or something like this. Okay. Um, so just to show again, uh, I might have my threat model be this box. Um, and so the, basically the idea is that you know, I'm adding some small perturbation. The perturbation I added is basically almost so small you can barely see it here. It, it's added a little bit of gray. It, yeah, it's better, it's easier, those are nicer contrasts. But um, yeah, so this is the idea is that I'm, I'm doing something small. I wanna make one sort of side observation, which, which is that it's important to make sure this region is small enough. Um, so people, uh, okay, so, so here's, Here's another thing you can do. Um, this image is in the test set. It's classified as an eight. Um, I can introduce a fairly large perturbation. So that all of us would label this as a three, but the classifier is invariant to perturbations and classifies this as an eight, which is now wrong. Uh, I, like, like done the other thing. Like I, I've made the human label switch, but the classifier's label not switch. Um, this is also an attack. I'm not going to talk about this kind of thing though. Um, but I just I want to put this up briefly just to sort of push back a little bit on the provable claims. Um, so, you know, there was a comment that, you know, you can prove that I can't defeat your classifier by making the function constant in some large region. Um, if the claim was very strong, then it might be so strong that you now lose against this kind of adversary where you certify that you're never going to change within radius five. And I make a change of radius five now that a human label changes but like your classifier's label doesn't change. Now it turns out today we're safe and we, we're not yet going above that, um, but you can't just keep on growing these balls indefinitely. Uh, and eventually it'll reach a problem where now the human label changes and the classifier's label doesn't change. And again, you're wrong. It's another kind of episode example. You don't know that you're safe because maybe there is a change which is smaller and will change. Right, yes, no, definitely. This is, but, but yeah, this is, the, um, this is the observation. It's just like you can't just keep growing these balls, but yeah, okay, yeah. That's in fact a big problem in NLP because you can add like one word of not and then the human label. You know. Exactly, yes. This is why in, in, in NLP we don't like using LP norms because yeah, I, I invert the, the, the word. You know, the movie was great, the movie was awful, um, differ in one word, but they actually do have different sentiment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. So this, this is the type of thing I'm going to be talking about, just small perturbations that change the classifier but not the human. Okay. So um, defense is to adversarial examples then. Um, so defense for my purpose satisfies two properties. Uh, it's good on the test set uh, and it resists adversarial examples. Uh, so the two things that I want. Um, I'm going to talk about the non-certified defenses in this talk because the certified defenses, as long as the proof is correct, everything in the paper is true. Um, there's a, what I'm going to talk about in this talk is the non-certified variants, which are people who propose something and saying this is a defense to adversarial examples without a proof. And the question there is, is it correct? And that's what makes those defenses very difficult. Um, okay, so let me give you a couple examples of what defenses you might think of. Um, we've seen adversarial training before, so I'm going to skip through basically all of it um, because I don't want to bore you. Okay, adversarial training is done. Okay, um, one more defense that you might consider. Um, this was a paper that was proposed at iClear last year. It's called thermometer encoding. 
Um, the claim is that um, neural networks are overly linear. Um, they are linear in regions where they shouldn't be linear, and so we're going to break this linearity, and hopefully this is going to help solve adversarial examples. And the way we're going to do that is I'm going to create a thermometer encoding input. So if I have my pixel value is 0.13, I'm now going to make the input be some ones followed by zeros. If it was 0.66, then I'd do more ones followed by some zeros. And if it was like 0.97, then it's all ones. So you know, it's like reading a thermometer value. And now this hopefully breaks the linearity of the inputs and allows the neural network to learn to be nonlinear in interesting ways and prevents adversarial examples. This is one proposal that I'll come back to. Um, or you could imagine that maybe I do some input transformations. You know, maybe perturbations are brittle, and so I'm going to take my image of a cat, and then I'll rotate it randomly, and then feed it through my neural network. Or I'll, you know, JPEG compress it, and then feed it through my neural network. Something else like this. Uh, these are all variants of defenses that we've seen, uh, and I'll come back to both of these in a little bit. So is it clear by everyone what I mean by episode examples and by defenses to episode examples? Um, so, what does it mean to evaluate the robustness of a defense to adversarial examples then? So the basic standard ML pipeline goes like this. You know, you, you train your model, um, you then you, you sort of get the accuracy by evaluating it on the test set, um, and then, you know, if the accuracy is good enough, you, know, you say, you know, state of the art, and if it's not good enough, then like, you know, go do more hyperparameter tuning or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, so, um, okay, so, so in, 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 you know, this step is very easy. Um, this is the straightforward step in most evaluations, like you just compute the accuracy on the test set. As long as you didn't train on the test set, basically you can't cheat. Um, and, and, you know, the talk on Monday was very nice in showing that we haven't even overfit the test set over the last 10 years of doing CIFAR evaluations, despite the fact that you might think you may have. Okay, um, so, yeah, this is the, like, it's very straightforward to do this. And robustness evaluations change this one line and make one different change, which is to run an attack on the test set. And the only thing that I'm doing in a, in a robustness evaluation is constructing this function A. Like, I play the role of the adversary. I try and make the worst test set possible to make your classifier wrong. And that is the only change that I'm doing to make this a robustness evaluation. Um, but, it, like, c coming up with this function is not is non-trivial. Like, I have to make sure that I think very hard and break the specific defense which is being evaluated. Yeah? Does the uh, attack depend that it, this, what you wrote here suggests the attack doesn't depend on the y values, the test y values? Okay, yeah. So the attack um, implicitly depends on the function that I'm attacking and probably on the, on the true labels. Okay, so, so you can define adversarial examples in a number of different ways. I can, the definition that um, you could give would be the function is now different. So if it was wrong before, I need to change it to be even more wrong or maybe to the correct label. Um, or you can give the definition that it's not equal to the true label. Uh, or you can give another definition, which is to say that it's equal to some targeted label that I have chosen in advance. So you know, I want every image in the test set to become classified as cat. Um, I'm sort of sweeping all of that under the rug. Oh, I saw another hand, yeah. I think the question was that A here is the only taking an X test, but it's also taking in the model, right? Yeah, yeah, right, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm sweeping all of this under the rug. Like, um, it can take in lots of other things, too. And I just, for notation, wanted to make this simple. Yeah. OK. Um, so the question then is, um, how well do people perform these evaluations? Because like, you might think it's kind of simple. You, know, you write this attack function. You sort of take PGD and run it, and then everything works. Um, and so how well do people do when running these evaluations? Um, so let me give you a case study um, from what happened at iClear 2018. Um, so um, I should mention in advance that most of these papers um, had very long evaluation sections. By space, most of these papers were roughly one half evaluation. Um, I sort of color coded the regions red by the papers, uh, by how much of them were evaluation. Um, and these are papers by very reputable places trying very hard to get them right. So it's not like these people were unintelligent or weren't trying. Um, uh, so we reevaluated these. Um, and we took all of the ones that were um, accepted at iClear last year. Uh, and we put four of them out of scope. They were either certified or they were not white box robust, or they didn't claim white box robustness. Um, of the remaining ones, Two of them were correct, 
uh, and seven of them were broken. And I'm using the words correct and broken very particularly here. Um, by correct, I mean the claims that were made in the paper were right. And by broken, I mean the claims that were made in the paper were largely wrong. Uh, I'm not going to say necessarily effective or ineffective, because that's sort of a relative thing. Yeah? What is, well, I guess you get the right, you, when you say the claim is right. So the paper made the claim under the threat model x, the accuracy is y, okay. and we tried to lower that accuracy and failed. That doesn't mean the claim is right. Uh, right, yeah. We, we, we could not invalidate it, and so I'm going to believe the claim. Um, I mean, like, someone else who could, tried harder could do better than us, but um, I'm not going to say that it's wrong unless I know it's wrong. I'll sort of, I'll t uh, in general, I'll trust someone unless I can show otherwise. Innocent until proven guilty. Yes. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so, um, what happened? Why is it that these were like papers accepted at iClear? Um, if they were all wrong. Um, so uh, this is the image I showed you earlier, um, where this is what the loss surface looks like of a standard neural network. Um, turns out what they did is they made the loss surface look like this. Uh, and because it's maybe a little hard to see, let me zoom into this one region here. And this is what the loss surface became to look like. And if I showed you this image and said, you're here, which way do you go to find an adversarial example? Like you would go, I have no idea. And you just pick a random direction and step that way and hope that you were right. And that's exactly what gradient descent does, right? It, if you're on the surface here, and the, like the, so it's facing this way, then you'll go down. And then now you're here, and then it's facing up this way, and you step that way. And you just spin in a circle forever until you stop um, and basically make no progress. Uh, and so this is what lots of things did. Uh, they sort of artificially complicated the lost surface and made it so that you couldn't perform gradient descent in order to find an adversarial example. Yeah? Are the troughs here colored differently, or are they also sort of a So this is all the light blue region, that, but this is a, in, like, in like a 3D rendering, which has some artificial sh lights with shadows so that you can see like, how the surface looks like. So that, that whole region, if you just looked at the, the 2D projection, would be? So like this region here corresponds to a mostly flat region up there. Um, so, you know, it's not the first time this happened. Um, this has happened many times before, um, and it keeps happening, and sort of, I don't know when it's going to stop. Um, but, like, it's uh, not like these papers in particular, which are wrong, like, this is sort of a reoccurring theme that people like to propose. It's like, and it just lets that the authors are repeating. Yeah, maybe it looks like the authors are repeating. Um, I took the ones that I had written. There are other ones that other people have written a lot. Um, it, Right. Um, I enjoy breaking things. That's sort of the thing I find most fun. Um, many other people do the more constructive thing, which is building things. Um, and you need lots of people doing that to find good ideas. And so I'm glad there are people doing that. Yeah, OK. Good. Yes, um, right. Yeah, yeah, it's lots of fun to break things. And you know, right, OK, anyway. Um, that's not the point of this talk. Um, so um, let me stop. OK, yes, good. So what did they do to make the service look like that? Uh, I will get to that in a second. Will you say what you did to find the adversarial? Yes, I will get to that too. But that's not cheating, right? I mean, you can make lost surface very complicated. That's a good idea. Right? It's a good idea to make the lost surface complicated. I disagree. Um, so the reason why I disagree is that the objective we're solving for, OK, so let me step back one second. There are two reasons why you might consider adversarial examples interesting. Either you have the security mindset, I want, if I want to make sure that an actual adversary can't defeat my system, or you have the ML mindset of I want to make machine learning better. Um, I mean, right, like adversarial examples are a consequence of some failure in machine learning to not do what humans do. And so we might, want, we might say that if we had better machine learning, adversarial examples wouldn't exist. If you're in this camp and you view uh, adversarial examples as a consequence of some failure of machine learning, then it's clear that what you care about is the existence and not the computational method of finding them. And that if adversarial examples exist, then it's bad. It's not just bad if they can be found through PGD. So in this camp, clearly, it, it, we, should, we should only care about the existence and not the computational method for finding them. In the other camp, for the security question, um, so I, I'm a computer security person. I have my PhD in computer security. Uh, the security field decided long ago that um, making the adversary think harder is the wrong way of deciding how good a defense is. The way that you decide how good a defense is, is if after the adversary has thought as hard as they can, 
then you quantify the amount of work they have to do like after having done that thinking. And so what I will introduce is a set of attacks that defeat those, like this complicated loss surface just as efficiently as a standard neural network. I just had to think a little bit more to do it ahead of time. And, and the reason why is that if you give me any fixed attack, I, I can come up with a defense which causes it to break in some stupid way. Um, that's sort of uninteresting. I mean, no matter what you do, like so imagine in traditional security, um, I have some malware file and it like executes on your machine. And now you like reverse the bit order on your processor or something. It's probably going to break the malware file. It's not because your thing is any more secure. It's just I didn't happen to try and break it. Yeah, someone. The order of quantifier, I'm all over the place. I can't understand it. So okay. what's happening first? So, the defense or the attack? Or so what, what should happen is the defense says, here is something which is secure. Yeah. And then the attack goes and tries to evaluate it. This is the order that you should operate in. Should yeah, this is how it should be in security. Um, the defender should go first, then the attacker goes. So, for all the Good. so you want to say that for all attacks, yes. I want to say that if you give me a defense for all attacks, they cannot be effective on this defense. Right. Um, and this is sort of the, the way that we, this is why doing defenses is so much harder. Because a defense has to work against all attacks, but if I give you a defense, then I can break it by just showing one thing is successful. So now I got it. But now what are you saying? That you're not doing it, you are doing it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to construct an attack which defeats the ones which the defenses which were proposed previously. Yes? Okay. Sorry, is everyone else? Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay, so if that's clear, then let me go on and tell you about some, some things that we've learned about evaluating robustness. Um, and this comes basically in, in two forms. Um, the first set of lessons that I want to talk about are lessons of the form. Um, what we've learned from, from doing evaluations and how to do thorough evaluations. And if we have time after this, then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about how to do good evaluations, but that's less important. So stop me if you have questions here, because this is the more important part anyway. Um, OK. So um, if we sort of look, look at the brief history of defenses, you know there have been lots of defenses, and many of them were broken. But the fortunate thing is that each time they were broken, we learned something by how they broke. Um, so there were some defenses that were proposed at IEEE security and privacy, and we learned about this thing that's called gradient masking. There was a problem with this defense, and uh, okay, then there were some other defenses that were proposed at iClear 2017, and then we learned like the attacker objective function is important to choose. And there were defenses that were proposed at CCS 2017, and we learned you know transferability of episode examples really helps the attacker a lot. And then there were some things that were proposed at iClear 2018, and sort of we said, okay, this is obfuscated <coughs> gradients. This is maybe gradient masking on steroids, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to sort of explain, sorry, explain a little bit about how that works. Um, so I showed you this picture earlier. I showed you this picture earlier of the really ugly loss funk surface. Um, the key observation is that while this here looks really bad, this function here looks basically the same as this function. Sort of like there's this light blue region, which is at the top, which is very tall. There's this green region as you go to the right. Same thing happens in both of these. There's the dark blue region here. There's the dark blue region here. Like the loss surfaces look very, very similar, despite the fact that these are two differently trained neural networks. Um, this one's easy to find adversarial examples for. This one, I know, looking at this picture, there are adversarial examples for, but they're hard to find. Um, and so you shouldn't expect this to be robust. Like I can point to the region where it's not robust, and it's right there. It's just finding that might be a little bit tricky. And so what we did is we came up with maybe a general technique for solving this in some cases that makes it so easy to, easier to evaluate. And I want to tell you a little bit about that one, um, but then, and then get to sort of some more general thoughts on this. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix gradient descent, um, at least fix it in terms of the way that these things broke it. Um, so imagine I had some image of a cat that I'm going to classify. And I had some neural network I'm going to feed it through, where some of the layers of the neural network here, colored in purple, are difficult to compute gradients through. Um, I've added some randomness. I'm dividing by something that's numerically unstable. I'm doing something that's confusing to make it hard to compute gradients through this thing. And the forward pass, that's fine. I just let it go. Go compute the forward pass. I get some, some logic values or probability values. And then I compute the backward pass. And when I compute the backward pass, I replace this purple function with this yellow function. And I replace it with something which is a lie, but has nice gradients. 
So if it's as similar as in, in function as the purple function is possible, but the gradients are nicer. So for example, um, if you're doing pre-processing with JPEG compression, the thing which should hold true with JPEG compression is that, oh wow, now we get lights. OK. Um, the thing that should hold true with, now we don't get lights. <laughs> the thing which should hold true with JPEG compression is that after you compress an image, you get the original image back as output. Like f of x should roughly be equal to x. This is the property of JPEG compression. So on the backward pass, you just pretend JPEG compression didn't exist. Um, I can't compute gradients through JPEG compression. That would be hard. But you know, the derivative of f of x with respect to x is approximately 1. So I just pretend it doesn't exist. And this works. Um, this gives me some gradient value, which isn't the actual true gradient value, but it's a good enough approximation where if I substitute this value into the gradient descent up and just repeat this a bunch of times as I do in regular PGD, then I can break all of these defenses. And it's a really simple trick. It doesn't actually take you any more computation. Maybe I now like double the number of gradient descent steps just because I had to lie what the gradient op was. Uh, but this basically works. And so this is in this one particular case what you have to do when you break gradients in this way. Um, but you know, there are probably many ways that you could break gradients. And this is not the only way thing you should do. Like this isn't the answer for how to deal with broken gradients. Um, this is one possible thing you can consider. And so when you, in general, when you have a model that you claim to be robust, um, you have to figure out what you need to do to recover useful gradients and then try and attack it. Um, basically, the thing here is that disentangling true robustness from apparent robustness is really non-trivial, uh, especially when we're doing gradient-based operations. It's, there are lots of ways to make the gradient point in the wrong direction, uh, and there are many fewer ways to actually make a robust model. I'm sorry, this is the one that gave you a very rough reference. Yes. This, this was the one? Uh, so when, yeah, so um, this is what happens when you, so this is the image for thermometer encoding. When you do thermometer encoding, one of the defenses I told you about briefly, um, the, the loss surface looks like this. I see. I see. Um, and then you replaced it. And I replaced it with something that made the loss surface look essentially more like this, but it was pointing a little bit in the wrong direction, but at least this is differentiable nicely. And so the, the key observation is that this function here looks similar to this function enough that on the backward pass, we're good. Any other questions? Okay, I have nine minutes. OK. Um, so let me then spend a little bit of time talking briefly about how to perform better evaluations. Um, and the reason I, I expect many of you probably aren't doing this right now um, the reason why you should care about how to perform good evaluations is that sort of, um, sort of the number of people doing work on adversarial examples is growing exponentially, and it may be you in the future. Uh, and so it's useful to know how to do this correctly, because if you end up writing a paper which says, I want to improve machine learning section 12 adversarial example defense, uh, it's useful at least to make sure that you get the evaluation correct. Um, and so I'm going to step through a little bit of things that we've learned about how to do these evaluations so that uh, you can get it right. Um, this is all from a paper that we wrote that's some 20-page report on how to do evaluations. Obviously, I can't cover all of it, but I'll sort of give you the highlights. Um, OK, so first let me tell you the things that are warnings that you shouldn't do. Um, and I'll mention that um, I want to be actionable with my advice, uh, and so I'm going to give you specific examples and images from papers that do things wrong. Um, everything I show is sort of standard practice, and everyone gets it equally wrong. Don't judge these papers. I'm going to sort of black out the regions I don't that aren't important, but I'm going to show you things from actual papers. Um, so the first thing that's necessary is you need to actually try and break your defense. Um, this means you need to, after you've spent six months designing something, think, how can I make it fail as good as possible? Like, and that's really hard to do. Um, and you need to make sure the adversary is aware of what your defense is doing. It's sort of not OK to say, well, what if the adversary doesn't know anything about my defense? Um, no, it's no adversary, and you've just published a paper on it. Uh, any person who cared is going to read your paper at the very least. Um, so you have to assume this. Um, OK, um, the next thing is that you know, there are lots of papers which like, have like, it looks like they're doing the right thing when they have some section called effectiveness. Um, and you think they're doing the right thing until you get to like section 3.4, which says robustness to the white box attacker, which is one paragraph long. Um, in which case, what was all of this doing? Um, it was sort of showing that like, if you didn't try very hard, that it, it's, it's effective. Which is good. I mean, it's a, that's a low bar. But like, move this to the appendix and make this the remaining paper. 
Um, OK, so there's, there's that. Um, I should mention that like held out attacks um, are, are not adaptive attacks. You actually need to design your attack to be defense. You can't just like not use some attack when designing your thing and then think it's like a held out attack. It's a held out attack? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but, but this paper uses them. Um, right. I mean, so like we have held out test sets, right? Like in machine learning. You can imagine how someone might think of a held out attack as like an attack that I didn't train on or something. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So you're, you're, so not, you define the attack beforehand. Yeah, right. Yeah, we're trying not to look at right. This, this is not a thing you do. Uh, okay. Um, this is an attack that's called FGSM. Right, exactly, yes. Um, yeah, this is, attack, this is an attack that's called FGSM. Um, basically, just don't use it. Uh, it's simple. It, it works for, for many things, but it's not meant for evaluations. Don't evaluate with it. Um, and when you evaluate with attacks and you do gradient-based attacks, you should do lots of iterations of gradient descent. Uh, it's important because sort of an attacker who can do 10 iterations of gradient descent can probably do 50. Like, it's, it's five times more work. If it was worth it ahead of time, it's probably worth it after. If you can show me that there's an exponential increase in the number of iterations of gradient descent you need, that would be interesting. I mean, the whole idea of crypto is, like, exponential work is hard. But if you have to do an O of n increase in the amount of work to break the thing, it's probably not worth making it unless you can maybe make the constant on the order of a million or something. Yeah. So here's like a metaphysical question. How hard should you try to do the adaptive attack? So like How sh hard should you try to do an adaptive attack? Yeah. Um, OK, so my answer to this is you should try hard enough so that all existing approaches fail. So the reason why I'm going to say this is that um, sort of in my mind, there are two types of defenses. There are ones which are, which are like broken by existing attacks, and there are ones that are broken by new attacks. Um, there are no secure defenses. Like you're either broken by things we know about or things we don't know, you know about. And as long as you're not broken by the things we know about, then someone else can like learn something new by breaking your defense. <laughs> okay. Like this is good. Like this is how research happens, right? Like you say, here's something that stops everything we know about today. And someone else can come along and say, well, here's this new thing we didn't know before, but now we know because I had to break your thing. It's sort of the unfortunate thing is when I have to write a paper that says, I take this attack I knew about, and I take, download your code, and I run the attack I knew about on your code, and your code breaks. And like, because this is unfortunate because like, you wasted everyone's time because now they've read your paper and it didn't teach us anything. It's so like, this is what we want. I want to make sure that I'm not like asking for perfection. I just want to make sure that we learn something by how the thing fails. Yes. So what are the existing uh, attacks like uh, basically? Run gradient descent. Like everything, like mm -hmm. there are like 50 different ways of people who've named, like there's like momentum squared iterative fast <laughs> gradient sign. Right. Run gradient descent. I don't care what you call it. Um, it's all the same. Yeah. Do you have a question? No. 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 Okay. No, but I mean, this is, I mean, you just told us that just run gradient descent. Yes. It can be too simple in many cases. Okay, right? yeah. So, so he was asking specifically there are like lots of different names of attacks. Um, exactly which one of those you use is basically unimportant. They all, like, people have written papers called different things with attacks introducing named different things. So like there's an attack called like the basic iterative method and there's like PGD. And, the the yes. The thing is that you come up with a defense. Right? Yes. And now just straight up gradient descent might fail. Yes. But as you told us before, right. that doesn't tell anything because it's simple yes. notification to it. Yeah, 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 definitely. Right. So, so, just, so saying just run gradient descent doesn't okay. seem sufficient. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So what I mean by just run gradient descent is, I mean, it doesn't matter which of the like 10 attacks that are gradient descent you run. Okay. You pick one of those, and then you think very hard about how to modify it to make it beat the defense as well as possible. Um, sometimes you'll get these tables that have like all of the possible attack people have developed before and the accuracy on all of them. Those tables are more or less useless. They, like, they could be re reduced to one row, which is gradient descent and the accuracy against it, with trying as much as possible to beat the thing and come up with a good loss function. That's the, sort of the argument I'm going to make, is like, put all your effort into coming up with a good loss function, and then run something gradient-based. I don't care what that thing is. Two minutes, OK. Um, OK, a couple just sort of sanity checks in the line of um, maybe Bean's work. Um, if you um, use more iterations of gradient descent, your attack should do better. If it doesn't, something has, bad has happened. Um, if I give you an unbounded amount of perturbation budget, you should eventually succeed. Um, if you can't succeed with unbounded perturbations, it means your attack is bad. You should fix the attack. Um, 
for example, um, you should probably do better than, than this, like maybe I'll go to this one. You should probably do better than 20% accuracy on ImageNet. So epsilon of 128 here means I can turn any image to solid gray. So you should be able to at least get 0.1% accuracy on ImageNet with this. Because my attack was just return solid gray is successful at this point down to here. Um, but for this one, it wasn't. So this means something is wrong. Um, you should always make sure that like, this function is monotonically decreasing. If I give you more power, you should do better. Um, this is sort of a common thing. Lots of things do worse when you give them more power. Um, just make sure it's not the case. Um, so enough bad things. Maybe let me tell you some good things before I finish. Um, whatever attack happens to be the best, uh, when you run them, report the numbers with respect to that. Don't say, well, this weak attack does worse on my model, and so I'm stronger. Um, so you have to evaluate based on whichever one is the most successful. Um, it's really helpful to me um, and everyone else when you plot the accuracy of your model versus how much distortion you introduce. Like this helps diagnose lots of potential problems. Um, here's one that does this well. It's sort of a nice monotonic decreasing function where they claim something at 0.3 and after 0.3 things fall off and I can at least verify that when you go up to 0.5 it's near zero. This is nice. Um, make sure you do enough iterations of gradient descent. Um, here's a nice figure from some paper that showed that for this model, they kept seeing increases or, or decreases in the, in the accuracy as they went up from 100,000 to a million iterations of gradient descent. I, I don't know exactly what's going on here, but it's really interesting that this happens. And if they had stopped at, uh, up here, they would have gotten a number which was six times larger than the true robustness. And exactly what this means is unclear, but it's really nice that they gave me this result. I don't know what to do with it right now, but I like that they did that. Um, there are some things which are gradient-free attacks. Try one of them. See what happens. And then finally, try random noise. Random noise is sort of the simplest thing you could imagine. Um, and if you can't defend against random noise and you can't defend against actual attacks, the nice thing here is it's hard to get random noise wrong. And in particular, all of the models that we broke in our iClear paper um, sort of do basically the same on random noise. Um, and so you might like have expected that if they don't do better than the baseline on random noise, maybe they don't do better than the baseline. Basically the same meaning basically same as, just as a baseline undefended network. Okay, so they're, they're resilient to random noise. Uh, they're not resilient. I mean, they're resilient the same way as, ran, as, like, as, a, as, a ran, as a regular network is. Okay. But like, if they were defense to adversarial examples, you might expect that they do better. So there's some theory that says that they should. Um, but I, I'm sort of running out of time, so I don't want to say any of that and just briefly make my one conclusion statement, um, which is I think that to understand episode examples the way that I like to think about them is you sort of repeatedly play this game where you attack and defend, and the defender says, here's a fundamental property of episode examples, and the attacker says, no, it's not. And then you repeat back and forth until you sort of learn the things that are fundamental about episode examples and what isn't. Um, and we sort of, when doing this, we optimize to try and teach ourselves as much as possible about this space, and hopefully eventually we'll conclude by sort of learning everything there is to know. Um, so with that, um, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. So you showed all these mountain ranges, yeah. and you seem to argue that the truth is smooth. And I'm not sure why that should be, but I was thinking, if the truth is smooth, is there a theory like the Nyquist rate, which is how much do I have to sample it before I actually capture the truth? Like, if you could tell me what the band limit of the truth is. Yeah. Right. So, OK. So this is a very interesting observation. Could I come up with a way of quantifying this? Um, so the concern with doing this is if I came up with a metric which said, how, like, how good your thing is, like, how much your model made the gradients ugly, then, like, I don't want someone to optimize against this metric. Like, any metric like ceases to become a good metric once people optimize for it. To the other guy yeah, right. With, like, band right. Yes. Uh, I, but like, I would want to write a paper on it or something. And is that a question? Ah, okay. Okay. Sure. Yes. Here. Here. And then here. So, so you said that uh, we shouldn't. The time that you spend thinking shouldn't count. Right? Okay. okay. Sure. Right. But what about the time you spend attacking? Yes. That. 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 So, okay. So, yeah. So how do you think we should think of that and take right. that? Right. So I. I think like like we do in crypto, which is that we should look at the polling, like the, the O of what for the adversary. And in crypto, we have very nice ways of defining this. In machine learning, we have no ways of defining this. Um, but uh, I would like to have better ways of capturing this. I don't think I have one now. But most things today tend to fail in like doubling the number of iterations. Like you sort of do two or three times as much work, and things fail. 
And, and the reason why I don't care about the small constants is like, I could probably pick like just the right learning rate and just the right step size when running the gradient descent to make them fail. I guess one of the questions is that in the cases that you didn't succeed in that time, yes. do you think it's because uh, those are actually robust? Because those are robust to tractable attacks or because those are robust to your attack? In the cases where we did, where we failed, which was which was adversarial training a la PGD by Madri and others, um, I believe it is the case that they are robust. They're truly uh, robust. I robust yeah, I think so. And part of the reason why is because I and many others have tried to break it repeatedly over the last two years and failed. It's only using tractable methods. Yes, only. But like, okay, so I can say that we have on very small networks verified. Okay, so if you take a tiny MNIST network and you train it with standard and you train it with PGD then you can prove that the very small network is at least five times more robust when trained with PGD. Um, I can certify this with mixed digital linear programming. And um, of course, that, cer that, that certification may all go out the window once I make a bigger network, but at least on small networks, this is true. Um, but yes, I, yeah. At this point, we're going to stop. So we have time for a break. So thanks, Nicolas.